and start the broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Lawless. I am the Chem Informatics Study Team Leader. And on behalf of Simulations Plus, I welcome you to today's webinar. Today's focus will be on the use of our software to predict metabolites of the TOX21 database. Toxicity predictions are then performed on the parent compounds and the predicted metabolites. Our speaker today is Dr. Stephen Ferguson of the Biomolecular Screening Branch of the National Toxicology Program. An opportunity to ask questions will follow Stephen's presentation today. You may there send your questions using the questions pane on the control panel or ask your questions directly using the hand raising icon. If you're using a telephone to listen to the call, please be sure to enter the unique audio pin displayed when you join the call. When you enter your audio pin, this enables us to unmute your line so that you can be heard. This webinar is being recorded for playback at our website, www.simulations-plus.com. I'll first give a short introduction to our metabolite module and then turn the presentation over to, to Steve. Okay. Uh, so the AdMet Predictor Metabolism Module contains many modules for predicting uh, metabolism, and we predict metabolism for both CYP enzymes and uh, UGT enzymes. Um, so we have five models that predict if a compound is an inhibitor of uh, cytochrome P450, and the models are for the five different uh, major CYP isoforms, 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 2D6, and 3A4. And uh, if uh, a molecule is an inhibitor of a CYP, uh, then that could potentially lead to drug-drug interactions uh, for another molecule that might be uh, metabolized by that same CYP. We also have uh, nine models that predict if a molecule is a substrate of a particular isoform of cytochrome P450. And these mo nine models include the five uh, CYP isoforms and in addition to 2A6, 2B6, 2C8, and 2C, uh, 2E1. Uh, both those are, are um, classification models. We also predict sites of metabolism. So this will take a molecule and predict where uh, it might be metabolized by these nine CYP isoforms. Um, if it predicts a particular site, then we can also display the metabolites uh, in MedChem Designer or use MedChem Studio uh, to generate those final metabolites. Uh, we also have uh, models that will predict kinetic parameters, such as Kmax, Kgam, Vmax, and clearance uh, for the sites of metabolism identified in, in the model. And I'll discuss that in a little more detail later on. Uh, and then finally, we have nine uh, uh, models to predict if a compound is a UGT substrate. And I list the nine isoforms. UGTs are uh, involved in phase two. Uh, metabolism, and they would add a glucuronidide uh, uh, to a site on the molecule. Uh, and this is typically the OHs, NHs, etc. Uh, if there's no particular UGT sites in the molecule, the model will just uh, report no sites. Um, so the next, this slide and the next one show typical um, uh, CYP P450 uh, oxidation. So in the first example. Uh, we have a, a, a carbon atom that's being um, hydroxylated, so an oxygen is inserted between the uh, carbon-hydrogen bond. Heteroatom dealkylation, uh, so kind of a similar reaction, but in this case the carbon uh, is next to either an oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur atom. Uh, so when this becomes hydroxylated, uh, it forms an unstable intermediate. Uh, that can decompose into the aldehyde or ketone plus either the um, alcohol, thiol, or amine. Uh, heteroatom uh, oxidation occurs when you have a nitrogen or oxygen, and the SIP adds an oxygen to that particular nitrogen or oxygen to form the uh, um, N oxide or the S oxide. And then finally, another example is epoxidation. Uh, this occurs at double bonds or aromatic rings and forms an epoxide. Uh, 
Uh, and currently, um, in MEMET predictor 7.1, we do not uh, uh, treat this particular reaction. So this slide just illustrates our approach to creating SIP sites of, of metabolism model, models. Uh, the first and most important point is to collect and curate the data from the databases. So um, it's important in order to create a good model, you have to have good data going into the uh, um, model building routine. So uh, we started out with the uh, Accelerus uh, Metabolite database, and this was uh, for formally created by uh, uh, Simex. And uh, since then, Accelerus has also changed its name. But it's basically a list of uh, uh, Metabolic, or metabolic reactions and references uh, uh, to those reactions, so a large compendium. Uh, we also extracted um, uh, data from a compilation by Sheridan uh, in JMED Chem in 2007. And then for all of our uh, data, we did extensive review of the literature, uh, both old and new. Um, so. The input to the uh, models are uh, to classify the atoms either as metabolized or not metabolized uh, based on the, the, the data in the literature, uh, generate atomic descriptors for each atom, and then build artificial neural network ensembles to predict the sites of metabolism. And uh, we ended up building nine models for each of the individual SIPs. Uh, each candidate receives a score. The highest scoring atoms are classified as sites. Uh, so here's just an example of propranolol. Uh, there are three sites of, of uh, metabolism uh, in, the, in the literature. So we have the 5-hydroxynaphthalene, uh, 4-hydroxynaphthalene, uh, uh, and then the um, uh, central carbon on the isopropyl gets hydroxylated, and then this um, has, is unstable, so it decomposes into the primary amine. Uh, so to, to, as input to our model, we would include all the potential sites uh, on the molecule. Note that the oxygen atoms in propranolol would not be um, um, marked as sites. So everything with the circle is a potential site. The ones with red are the experimentally observed sites. So uh, when we build the model, each row would be an atom in this molecule, and then uh, we'd have a column indicating whether this was an observed uh, site of metabolism or not. And then we have many, many molecules, or excuse me, uh, many molecules in, in, in each model. Uh, so here's an example of uh, one of the particular models we built. Uh, um, um, so when we build models, we uh, create a grid of artificial neural network ensembles, and each cell uh, in this uh, uh, sheet would represent a particular model. So here we've highlighted a model with 60 inputs uh, and 13 neurons, and we get a truth table out of that. So uh, in the lower left-hand corners are the true negatives. So these are atoms that we predicted are uh, not sites of metabolism, and experimentally they weren't observed as uh, sites of metabolism. And then in the upper right-hand corner, these are all the um, uh, true positives. So these are atoms that we predicted are sites of metabolism, and they are experimentally uh, observed. Uh, over in the left-hand uh, upper corner are our false negatives. So these are atoms we predicted to be sites predicted not to be sites, uh, but they were experimentally observed. And for this data set, uh, less than 1% of the compound of the atoms are predicted as uh, false negatives. Uh, when we go down in the lower right-hand corner, these are where we're predicting uh, atoms to be sites of metabolism, but they're not experimentally observed. Um, so in this case, 8.6% of the, the atoms uh, are uh, false positives. Now, uh, we have looked at uh, uh, compounds where we predicted a site of metabolism, but it wasn't uh, experimentally observed in the literature. And then later, a publication came out indicating that this was a site of metabolism. So we've converted uh, false positives into uh, true positives. So all of this uh, happens in the background, and so all you have to do is 
um, enter your compound into AbMet predictor, and uh, it will produce the uh, sites of metabolism. So you enter the whole molecule, and then one way to visualize uh, the sites of metabolism is shown here on the left. So in this particular molecule, it's marked uh, this carbon atom next to the oxygen as the site of metabolism, and uh, it has a score of 942. So that's much higher than any other sites of the, uh, on the molecule. And this is for 1A2. Now, if our substrate model uh, indicated that this was not a, a, a substrate for 1A2, then we would display this uh, in a gray mesh instead of a red mesh. So that's one way in which our models kind of work together. So first we produce predict if it's a substrate, and then um, if it is a substrate, we'll color the, the sphere red. Another way to uh, visualize the metabolites is shown on the right. Uh, so this is done in MedChem uh, Designer. Uh, so simply take the compound, uh, sketch it into MedChem Designer, push the M button uh, to produce the metabolites. Uh, in this case, it's hydroxylated. Uh, this carbon atom here uh, again forms an unstable intermediate and falls apart in, into the phenol. And so Steve, uh, and then another way is to enter this molecule into MedChem studio and then say generate metabolites and uh, that's what Steve did and he'll discuss that in uh, his webinar. All right, we also um, uh, predict Michaelis Menten kinetics, uh, KM, VMAX, and uh, clearance uh, for uh, the, the sites of metabolism. And so here's an example of literature results, again, for uh, propranolol. So we have the uh, three sites of metabolism on propranolol, and then the uh, KM, VMAX, and clearance. Uh, so we would gather data from the literature uh, for KM, VMAX, and clearance, and then we would create a, uh, three, three models uh, to predict these uh, uh, various kinetic parameters. And uh, Steve used the, the clearance uh, predictions in uh, his webinar. Okay, uh, so I'll leave that slide up, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce Dr. Steve Ferguson, uh, who's a scientist at the Biomolecular Screening Branch of the National Toxicology Program. Uh, his primary role there is to lead out efforts in the development of more predictive and physiologically relevant in vitro assay approaches, such as in vivo liver models. And this is to support the identification of hazardous chemicals and extrapolation of mechanisms of toxicity, such as nuclear receptor activation. Uh, Stephen has a background uh, focused on the development and application of in vivo liver models, uh, study of drug metabolites and clearance, identification of drug-drug interactions and mechanisms and predictions for humans, uh, roles of nuclear receptors in uh, regulation of gene expression and in vitro toxicology approaches. Uh, Steve also has an interest in understanding the quantitative relationships between in vivo responses and in vivo outcomes. Uh, before joining the biomolecular screening branch, uh, Stephen led the AdMet Tox uh, uh, research programs at Life Technology, uh, which is formerly uh, Cells Direct, where his group investigated development of in vitro tools for hepatic biology, drug clearance, drug drug interaction research. Uh, so now it's my pleasure uh, to turn it over uh, to Stephen. Thank you, Michael. Hi. So let's see if I can, can everyone see my screen okay? Yep, that looks good. Okay, great. So uh, as, as Mike mentioned, um, today I'm going to talk about how we've used some of the tools that Simulations Plus has developed to be able to try to tackle this very large set of chemicals in the TOX21 program. So before I really begin, I need to just make the statement that the statements and opinions or conclusions contained in this presentation do not necessarily reflect or represent statements, opinions, or conclusions of NIHS, NIH, or the United States government. So I'm going to just basically uh, give you a brief outline. So the, the seminar will start with just a brief introduction of what is TOX21 for a lot of folks who may not be as familiar with that, and the 10K library of chemicals. Then I'll uh, have a little bit of background on why we think it's important to incorporate xenobiotic metabolism into TOX21. And then I'll go into my analysis using these tools. And then I'll conclude with uh, some summary and future direction. So. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, back in 2007, the National Academy of Science uh, issued a report 
that basically uh, laid out a path for uh, 21st century toxicology, and that would include uh, the use of in vitro human cells or cell lines to evaluate uh, chemical toxicity potential uh, as potential tools for uh, reducing uh, the, the need for animals and animal testing and potentially replacing some of those uh, with in vitro approaches or slower organism approaches that, that might actually uh, you know, have relevance to humans. So TOX21 was formed and it had goals to identify patterns of com compound response using high throughput assays that were generally developed for pharmaceutical research uh, and characterize the various toxicity and disease pathways to try to facilitate cross-species extrapolation and modeling low-dose extrapolation. Also, uh, some major goals were to try to prioritize chemicals for traditional toxicology evaluations and develop predictive models uh, for biological response in humans. So the, the, you can sort of think of TOX21 as this sort of collaboration across four different government agencies. Uh, the FDA, headed up by Susan, Susan Fitz, Fitzpatrick. Uh, the NCGC, uh, now called NCATS, headed up by Anton Simonov. The EPA and NCCT group within EPA headed up by Rusty Thomas, and then in our group at the NIEHS, uh, Ray Tice. And there are four different groups that really are sort of responsible for the, the primary responsibilities within TOX21. So there's an assays and pathways working group, a chemical selection group, an informatics group, and a targeted testing group. And, and each of these groups have representatives from uh, the individual uh, groups that are responsible. So that's just a general background of what we're trying to do. Uh, and uh, the assays and pathways working group really tries to identify which assays to run and to review the assays performance and, and next steps. The chemical selection group is really responsible for the chemistry side of things and making sure we understand what we have, what we've tested, and, and, uh, and making sure we can obtain what we need. The informatics group is really in charge of trying to say uh, what happened in the data and, and what does that tell us about next steps and, and which, which types of data might we need. And then the targeting testing group is sort of evaluating more the in vivo relevance of the results. And so uh, the TOX 2110K library is really comp comprised of uh, differing numbers of chemicals depending on when you're referring to in the timeline of its progression. But uh, there were chemicals nominated by EPA, by NTP, the National Toxicology Program where I work, and NCGC. Uh, and there, there's some overlapping chemicals across that space, but essentially they're uh, essentially 8,300 uh, unique compounds in the, in the particular library set that a lot of the data has been generated in. Um, and if you look at the subsets of chemicals within those nominations, NCATS uh, and NCGC had nominated quite a few drugs and active pharmaceutical ingredients. EPA uh, had 3,700 chemicals that were comprised of uh, pesticides, antimicrobials, endocrine disruptors, uh, uh, chemicals from the OECD Molecular Screening Working Group, uh, some FDA DILI, drug-induced liver injury uh, chemicals, and uh, some representative failed drugs from, uh, from pharmaceutical research. And also in NTP, uh, our 3,200 3, roughly chemicals were comprised of uh, NTP historically studied chemicals, chemicals that had been nominated to NTP, uh, chemicals that were reference chemicals and other in vitro alternative uh, approaches within NICETAM and ICBAM, and then external collaborators as well as um, <clears throat> some mixtures, a few, a few mixtures to be able to, to begin evaluating multiple uh, chemical structures within the, the same uh, uh, mixture. So <clears throat> if you look at the chemical space, if you will, uh, in terms of the types of chemicals and you, you plot out the complexity, the polar surface area, and the log P of these various chemicals, what you find is uh, th that the drug space is, is quite a bit more um, sort of focused, if you will, the druggable chemicals with the, 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 the sort of ideal properties for absorption and distribution within, within humans uh, that, are, that are done. It, we don't have that advantage in the environmental chemical space. You can see the broader uh, range of chemistries associated with uh, chemicals that would be uh, in the TOX 21 10K library. And so um, that's one of the challenges in this area and applying some of these tools that have been developed for pharmaceutical research where you have inorganics, you have organophosphates, you have other 
molecules that, that really aren't reflective of a typical drug that's, that's used and, and trying to be able to, to use some of these tools. But nevertheless, uh, you know, our, our goal is to try to tackle these concepts in, in this in, in this world. So um, in TOX21, there, there, there have been multiple phases. The initial phase one from 2005 to 2010 was really a proof of concept uh, with smaller sets of chemicals and assays, uh, as well as um, some, some HTS assays uh, looking at uh, subsets of those TOX21 chemicals that you saw in the 10K library. Um, then phase two, really, that's where the meat of the, uh, the bulk of the, the data has been generated thus far. It, and it included ToxCast uh, phase two, which had 700 chemicals over approximately 700 assays. NCGC and NCATS uh, would run the, the 10,000 K library, which is roughly 8,300 plus or minus some, depending on when we are, uh, where we are in the library's progression. Uh, but screened three times at 15 concentrations, focused on receptor modulation, stress pathways, and characterizing human variability in response. Uh, there are quite a few limitations, of course, in this approach because you have limited pathway coverage, uh, focus on specific uh, gene reporters and immortal cell lines, uh, the focus in uh, single compounds, limited capability for xenobiotic metabolism, which I'll talk about as we move forward, focus on simple biological systems and individual pathways rather than integrated pathways, limited acute exposure scenarios, and uh, limited availability for human toxicological data. So as a result of that, we've kind of moved into phase three of TOX21. And, and really the goals in, in this are to, to develop more physiologically relevant uh, in vitro models that model some of the more complex biology uh, where multiple pathways are working together uh, with a particular initial focus on looking at in vitro liver models that incorporate xenobiotic metabolism. Uh, and I'll talk about that rationale more uh, in a few slides. Uh, also uh, looking at lower organisms like zebrafish and C. elegans to provide information uh, to generate uh, assays with these systems that are data rich. Uh, for example, high content assays or cell stress pathway assays, gene expression assays in, in large numbers of genes and, and high throughput to allow us to be able to understand how chemicals are perturbing biological pathways and being able to, to identify patterns and be able to understand uh, how these chemicals uh, might be important in terms of human health. Also, we would like to develop uh, longer-term exposure approaches that model more cumulative toxicity over lower dose, longer exposure, as well as uh, accumulation of chemicals, to develop methods for extrapolating in vitro data into actual human relevance using similar uh, approaches that, that have been developed in other areas like drug development or coming up with new approaches as, as needed. Uh, evaluation of disease. Uh, models, being able to develop some of these to, to be able to model sensitive populations and looking at inflammatory models or models for liver fibrosis and obesity are, are some of the things we're thinking about. Uh, increased use of in silico QSAR models, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and integrating all this stuff into adverse outcome pathways. So this is really the direction the program's headed, and I'm going to talk about a very small bit of it today uh, regarding the, the, the in silico metabolism. So, why do we care about the xenobiotic metabolism so much in TOX21 research? Well, it turns out that toxicity in vivo is frequently attributed to the formation of reactive metabolites or metabolites that have some toxicological uh, 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 properties. And so the idea is that most TOX21 assays to date are thought to be largely deficient in xenobiotic metabolism competence. Now that's a that's not really been measured yet. It's just been uh, presumed, and you know that may be true, and it may not be true, and it may be that the metabolism is there, but but different maybe from what the predominant metabolism is in, say, for example, human liver. And so we're going to address that. In, in vitro models, effectively incorporating uh, appropriate levels of xenobiotic metabolism have the potential to more effectively model metabolically activated toxicity. But we do have this issue of modeling the predominant amount of metabolism as well as trying to get the, the identification of the metabolically activated toxicity and trying to, to basically accomplish both of those goals is a challenge. In vivo animal models can vary extensively from humans with regard to xenobiotic metabolism and so we want to understand the human relevance of all this and develop systems that allow us to assess human health that we have the potential for overestimation of chemical toxicity uh, 
uh, in, in in vitro systems that lack metabolic competence, and so being able to use uh, systems that that both uh, that, that more appropriately estimate chemical toxicity as a goal, especially as we get into more quantitative approaches. And then finally, incorporating xenobiotic metabolism into TOX21 is a, an established goal of the program, and it's high priority for what we're trying to do. So when we when I first started thinking about how we were going to do this, I kind of created these buckets of, of, of how we would go about assessing xenobiotic metabolism in TOX21. And, uh, the first, sort of first bucket that, that, that's on the left here is in silica methods, and I'm going to talk about this uh, within the talk. Uh, but the idea is to evaluate different approaches that are available um, to try to predict at some level the extent of metabolism. So how much metabolism or which chemicals are likely to be extensively converted into something different that may not have been assessed in current screening approaches. Um, to predict putative metabolite structures that may have structural alerts in those and be able to understand what you know, potentially hazardous metabolites uh, may, may, be, may be there and be able to use those two approaches to prioritize chemicals for uh, studying in metabolically competent systems and potentially in vivo at some point. We also want to assess putative metabolite structures in those QSAR models as, as a way to, to be able to get a handle on that, and, and the AdMet predictor software uh, has both of those integrated together, which is very helpful for our goals here. Uh, we also wanted to identify uh, enzyme pathways that are associated with TOX21 chemicals, and so identifying substrates for P450s and UGTs is certainly relevant. And then eventually we want to develop approaches for extrapolating in vitro data into human uh, in vivo systems and being able to use uh, systems like the Gastro Plus software to be able to, to model the pharmacokinetics there. Uh, in addition to in silico approaches, which definitely will be a key part of prioritization because it's just simply too expensive to, to try to screen ourselves uh, in these very expensive models uh, through thousands of chemicals, uh, we also uh, envision developing uh, direct exposure models uh, with metabolically active cells, and we put that in quotes because to, to date, a lot of the, the research that's done there, you know, calls it competent, but but how much is there? How much is needed? And we're gonna we're gonna address that. But you can envision using engineered cell lines or 2D or 3D culture models that have been purported to have a metabolic competence, like the primary hepatocytes, HEPAR G cells, um, 3D culture models as well. Uh, and some more recently, some of the co-culture models have begun to be, uh, gain in popularity and, and use in publications. And so evaluating some of those and abilities of chemicals to, to cause metabolism and toxicity of, uh, as a result of that in those metabolically competent systems. Um, also, you can think of indirect methods where uh, you might condition chemicals. For example, in toxicology research currently, people condition chemicals with uh, liver S9 uh, from rats and then use that uh, in an AIMS test to be able to assess genotoxicity uh, in a metabolically activated system, which oftentimes is associated with genotoxicity. And so we might imagine similar scenarios where we develop models that are, that are robust in their metabolic competence and then integrating those into other assay systems. Also, we might envision uh, co-cultures and flow models that, that can integrate those two together. And there are several commercial platforms that are already available uh, that, that may be useful for us in this area. But today I'm really going to just talk about this, this sort of pillar on the far left and the work we've done uh, so far to be able to evaluate the tools for in silico metabolism. So in, in sort of surveying the different software that was out there, um, we came across the admit predictor software, and at the time I, I, I really was pretty new to this whole in silico metabolism uh, area, uh, but I noticed that it had a, uh, an ability to handle large numbers of chemicals uh, and to be able to do batch analysis and uh, generate data for human uh, endpoints. It also had uh, the ability to predict metabolite structures, substrate, as well as extent of metabolism for a few of the models. And so those were all things that we were trying to do. So it seemed like a good platform. It also uh, has a lot of other properties that Michael uh, referred to earlier. Um, and uh, you know, I won't go into all of that, but uh, essentially what we did was essentially assess the predictivity of these approaches and we analyzed the 10K library. Uh, and then we use that, and we are continuing to use that to be able to rank and prioritize chemicals. And so I'm going to go into more detail around this, but it's been a great collaboration so far with Simulations Plus. So 
Michael talked a bit about the metabolism predictions. Uh, this one slide basically just talks a bit about the toxicity predictions that are also in the model, uh, the ADMET predictor, so predicting estrogen receptor and androgen receptor binding. Um, it, it can predict uh, several aquatic toxicity endpoints, skin sensitization, respiratory sensitization, uh, chromosomal aberrations, and uh, AIMS genotoxicity are also uh, very relevant to the, the types of chemicals that we often run across in NTP. Um, phospholipidosis, reproductive tox, uh, there are quite a few liver enzyme leakage markers. Uh, and uh, in addition, we were surprised to see that there were predictions for rat and mouse carcinogenicity and acute toxicity in vivo. And so we haven't exactly figured out how we're going to use these yet, but we're definitely interested in evaluating them further. Uh, and so the, the models that are here uh, are, are, have currently uh, been used to generate information, and now we're in the process of trying to evaluate uh, how useful those are. But for today, I'm really going to mostly focus on the metabolism work that we've done so far. And so the first step that we, we took with ADMET Predictor was actually to, um, to, to analyze the ability of the software to generate uh, the correct call, uh, as, as published later, literature would have it anyway, uh, with regard to the substrate predictions. And so we constructed a database uh, of, of chemicals here uh, that would be positively associated with substrates for the five enzymes that had quantitative models, so that's at 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 2D6, and 3A4. And there were differing numbers of chemicals uh, that had known or reported uh, information on them, but we analyzed the TOX21 uh, 10K library for yes, no, as well as this database. And what we found is that there's a lot of green here. The, the green predictions basically were a correct or a uh, prediction of the, the known association, and the red were, uh, were not predicted, and the yellow were not within the prediction model uh, for a couple of reasons that, that I can get into if people want to know more about that. But the take-home we took from this was that the substrate predictions for these five quantitative models did a good job, and if we had more time, and we will eventually, we'll extend this out to the other 18 enzymes that, that are in the models, but we thought this was useful enough to move forward, and fortunately, Predicting substrate is not really the, the, it doesn't provide information to identify which chemicals we should test sooner in metabolically competent systems because it's more of a, an individual pathway association. It doesn't necessarily associate with how extensive that metabolism would be or if their metabolism led to any toxicity. And so we sort of moved forward to other systems. But if you want to look at the numbers, uh, the, the model did a nice job with substrates, and it predicted between uh, 76 for 2C19 up to, to 93%. And we don't know how many of these chemicals were actually in the training set, but we, we feel confident for this database we, we developed completely independently that the, the model was working uh, well. So when we analyzed the 10K library, you can see that we had uh, a variety of uh, slices, if you will. There were 47,000 uh, total hits called, and um, 500 chemicals had no predictions with this particular analysis, and, and I can get into that a little bit later, but some of them were outside the chemical domain of the models. Um, in addition to that, we had um, uh, 7,588 out of 81. 8,193 molecules called as a substrate for at least one enzyme, um, and only 105 were not identified as a potential substrate for at least one enzyme. So here's the sort of histogram of what that looks like, and over here on the right is just a list of the chemicals that hit 15 or 16 of the enzymes uh, in the model. And so you can see a lot of phenolic compounds, which makes sense because those would be more readily glucuronidated and, and would certainly be bias towards uh, you know, hitting more of the, the, the list of 18 enzymes, nine of which were UGTs and nine of which were P450s. But you can get an idea of how that, uh, that distribution went and, and how many chemicals were hitting which enzymes. And so we have this information and we think it can be useful for us in our research as we move forward. Uh, here's also a list of the, the chemicals that hit all nine P450s. Just for reference, I'm not going to go through all of those, but just gets you a flavor for uh, the types of chemicals that were, uh, were, were hitting all these different enzymes. And that you know, doesn't necessarily mean anything bad. It just means that they are substrates for P450s, which is generally the way, the way it goes with xenobiotics. So we also took a, a look at the TOX21 um, 
the analysis of this metabolism with um, a heat map, basically, basically doing a, a correlation analysis, and Ray Wah Ja did this for us. It was really nice of her, and we just basically got an idea of how the chemicals are related to one another and how the metabolic pathways are related to one another. And so we'll dig into this a bit more as we move forward, but uh, it basically gave us just a, a general overview of what the metabolism uh, prediction uh, profile looked like. Um, now, I want to go into extent of metabolism. I mentioned earlier that you know, the substrate calls are useful, but not necessarily reflective of something that's going to be uh, helpful, as helpful in prioritization. But uh, the relevance of xenobiotic metabolism to toxicology research can be related to metabolites, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, for example, producing reactive metabolites. And the extent to which these metabolites are produced is important, uh, and it's not necessarily reflected in a lot of the, the approaches, but at least understanding how extensively a chemical is converted into something different would help us understand which chemicals may not have been effectively assessed in current uh, screening methods. So xenobiotics are extensively metabolized in vivo uh, may have a higher probability of under or overestimation of toxicity using these alternative models, as I mentioned. And so in vitro models using human liver cells and subcellular fractions from human liver um, that have these natural combinations and levels of enzymes uh, have been effectively used to predict human metabolic clearance and, superior and are superior for estimates uh, within individual enzymes. And so the idea is trying to find a way to collapse multiple individual enzymes into a single collective clearance uh, is probably going to be uh, more helpful to us in prioritization. And so a lot of the in silico models, unfortunately, really are only built on individual enzymes, as was the case here with the AdMet predictor, but that's where we have the most uh, consistent data that allows us to build those models. And so we'll have to see how this evolves, but um, integrated models uh, could be a bit uh, more helpful for this. But what we decided to do was combine the predictions from AdMet predictor for individual clearances across those five enzymes that had quantitative models uh, and basically uh, sort of collapse them into a single overall clearance power. And the way we did that was that we did it a weighted sum approach where we uh, looked at the relative expression levels of these different P450s in human liver and we took the fraction of those five uh, weighted essentially by their relative expression levels, and we just sum that across the five clearance predictions for each, uh, each chemical. And so we also constructed a database of literature data uh, related to metabolic clearance, and we started with human liver microsomes in this case rather than hepatocytes because uh, they would be more biased towards P450s, which are in the domain of these predictions. So, and we, and we generated 74 compounds in this database uh, of quantitative uh, extent of metabolism or metabolic clearance predictions or actual observed data uh, with human liver microsomes. Uh, we then used AdMet Predictor uh, in this sort of weighted sum approach uh, uh, in, in tandem to, to basically be able to generate uh, uh, this overall CLINT prediction, if you will. And so, in general, um, the, the initial correlation with all the data points was was modest, and it wasn't designed for this, so it made sense that that was true. It was only about 0.3. However, there's this one outlier. This this particular compound was in denivir, and if you take this one outlier out, the correlation gets more uh, more effective, although it's a small data set. What you can say from this is that there's a directional relationship, and there seems to be some utility, but uh, you know, we're not clear exactly how useful this is going to be. It certainly would be better to have models built from data that were using human liver microsomes, and I believe Simulations Plus and other folks are, are in the process of doing that. But we, we used what we had, and so the, generally speaking, it gave us a directionally um, yeah, correct number that allowed us to potentially bend the library based on chemicals that were more extensively or less extensively metabolized. And so um, we evaluated various bin levels, if you will, um, based on the data in the clearance database that we, we put together. And we identified a cutoff of about of a pre predicted value of 100 microliters per minute per mig uh, that would allow us to segregate higher and lower clearance compounds at a threshold of observed clearance in microsomes of about 20 microliters per minute per mig. And that captured about 86% of the high clearance, if you will, you know, compounds that had higher than, than, than the 20 threshold. Uh, and for the, the negatives, it actually uh, captured about 
if you include those for a total, uh, it actually captured about 64%. So seems seems certainly useful, um, and and we're definitely thinking about this as regard to, to to prioritizing. But I don't think that the jury's completely out on that yet. But I will say that this approach was extended over the full Tox 21 10K library. And we were able to take the 8,300 chemicals using this approach and bend it down to 736 chemicals, which would be much more uh, tangible or possible to screen in, in robust metabolically competent systems. So, uh, you know, we're certainly thinking about this and how it plays uh, into our efforts as we move forward. We also have efforts to further evaluate the utility of these rankings and um, combine CLINT predictions and extent of metabolism predictions using alternative weighting methods like the TOX-PI approach that I'll talk about a little bit more when I get into the toxicity prediction data. But in general, um, you know, we're, we're, we're somewhat excited about this particular uh, approach, but we do believe that better models that are built off of actual clearance data in hepatocytes or microsomes might actually be more useful for this. But, um, you know, we're, we're moving forward with what we have. So. I uh, also want to just take a step back and talk about MedChem Studio for a minute. So one of the issues, that it's a very practical one when you deal with this very large set of chemicals, is the fact that you you got 8,300 chemical structures and you generate all these metabolites, you need something to be able to handle all this information. And we were very pleased with the MedChem Studio software uh, to be able to view and interact and do structure activity relationships with um, with these chemicals, and I'm not going to talk about that that work today, but I'm just going to basically just highlight that uh, this, this, in particular, this platform was very helpful to be able to generate from the admit predictor predictions of sites and metabolism to be able to predict metabolite structures, which uh, a lot of the software approaches that we've run into so far uh, don't they don't go quite that far. They'll predict the site of metabolism, but you don't actually get a, a putative structure to then move forward with additional uh, analysis. So we were excited about that. So if you looked at um, MedChem Designer, um, which is part of the MedChem Studio package, um, you can generate these types of metabolism trees, if you will. And so this is one round of metabolism for tamoxifen, and it gives you uh, as Michael was showing earlier, the, the different uh, metabolites that would be generated and the enzymes that would be associated with those conversions for a round of metabolism. So this is quite useful, certainly nice to have these for presentations and things when you're trying to convey uh, what's happening uh, in terms of a chemical structure scenario. Um, we, we sort of uh, took this metabolite generation approach and, and the fact that it covers nine P450s uh, and we, we, we basically extended that into analyzing the TOX 21 10K library. And before we really got going, we did realize that it would be somewhat limited because the software doesn't generate quinone or epoxide structures uh, at this time, at least with the admit predictor 6.5. Um, but we did run it on uh, some, you know, TOX 21 chemicals in one of the sort of poster child chemicals for metabolically activated toxicity is this benzo-alpha pyrene that leads to... Um, has a metabolite, and this 7,8-dihydrodiol-9,10 epoxide structure is associated with, uh, with, with cancer. And it turns out that um, while the, the software couldn't predict the epoxide structure, it did predict a, a related structure um, that's a precursor for that after a couple of rounds of metabolism. So, you know, while not certainly perfect, we, we think there's utility, you know, basically in this approach, and we're continuing to evaluate that. But one of the things we did notice, you know, with this sort of focus on P450s that, that are so involved in, you know, drug clearance, uh, you miss out on a lot of the other enzymes and alternative transformation types that might be more relevant for environmental chemicals like esterase cleavage, uh, dehalogenation reactions are a big one, epoxide formation, as we mentioned, metalloids and inorganic type transformations, amidases, uh, degradation products, amino acid conjugation, phase two metabolism, uh, even the UGTs that are covered in the software, uh, there's not, they're not yet integrated into uh, metabolite uh, predictions at this time. Uh, so, you know, while we, we think there's utility, we're certainly hoping to see a progression towards a, a broader transformation space. But we did evaluate what we had, and um, so the first thing we did was develop a database of about 211 known metabolite structures. Now, 
unfortunately, the databases that we, we, we were able to evaluate at the time we did this um, were largely comprised of metabolically uh, activated toxicants. And so a lot of those metabolites wouldn't necessarily have reflected the predominant metabolites that were in the, in the in, in, you know, found in vivo, but rather would be associated with a given toxicity. And so as we looked at this, you know, certainly we'd like to build a better database associated with you know, metabolites, and we're going to do that. Uh, but no metabolites were compiled from human studies um, with, uh, and, and limited to respective parent chemical structures found in the TOX 2110K library. Um, the TOX 2110K library was analyzed in MedChem Studio and Admit Predictor 6.5, and we used all nine P450s and three rounds of metabolism. So we took the first round of metabolism, we then took those metabolites and ran them through a second round, ran those metabolites from the second round a third time. And, and the idea was because multiple levels of metabolism can happen and we just arbitrarily picked three because we didn't want to generate an insane amount of information to try to computationally manage. Although you could argue that what we did generate was a, an incredibly large amount. But nonetheless, uh, putative metabolite structures were predicted and, and cross-referenced with this database of 211 chemicals. And so for the drug structures, there are 41 in here, the software did a pretty good job. It was about 80 percent, 81 percent um, that were correctly predicting a, the metabolite structure um, that was actually observed in the database. Uh, so that's really good news. Um, some of them were not predicted in green, and then also there were quite a few that just weren't predictable just because of the transformation type that, uh, you know, you see a glucuronide, well, there's no glucuronide metabolites generated here, so, so sort of out of the domain of what it is. But overall, for the drugs, it was very good. Um, However, for the environmental chemicals, when we extended this out, we actually found that only 87 of the 211 compiled metabolite structures were actually within this sort of predictable transformation space where, uh, you know, it's so focused on P450s, and that's because of a lot of those other re reactions that I talked about. But of those 87, we were able to predict 79% correctly, even across environmental chemicals. So or at least across TOX21 chemicals. And so that, that's, that, that, that's good news, but, um, you know, again, we need models that extend out past the P450s in the toxicology uh, world. But a more comprehensive database of metabolite structures would also help us to be able to, uh, that, you know, that focused on, the, on all the metabolites and not just maybe the toxic metabolites would also give us a better handle on how well the software is working. And so we're going we're gonna to redouble our efforts to build a more comprehensive metabolite, data, metabolite database to go forward. Um, here's a sort of flavor for some of the analysis. So we, we took the, the chemical structures uh, that were analyzable and we ran that through and, and we generated about 126,000 metabolites. Again, having MedChem Studio to be able to handle these data was, was very valuable for us. Um, but we were able to, to remove the duplicates and, and basically there's 126,000 unique structures that were, were generated from this. Uh, and evaluation of the accuracy and utility of the predictions uh, is still in progress uh, and includes development of a more comprehensive databases I mentioned. Uh, here's some examples of, of correct predictions, acetonitrile, finastin to acetaminophen, um, the midazolam going to a couple of its major metabolites, and I mentioned benzofepyrene going to this precursor metabolite, uh, although likely not through the, the, the conventional epoxidation method uh, or mode. But, but nonetheless, there were definitely some successes here. I thought it was interesting uh, when you look at the number of metabolites generated in round one versus round two versus round three, that you got uh, sort of a little bit more than, than – uh, uh, doubling but not quite exponential uh, increase in the number of structures, and so that there may be some interesting information there. We also uh, evaluated the toxicity predictions within the software, and it actually was uh, quite uh, quite interesting uh, that there were quite a few uh, toxicity predictions here. So we took both the parent chemicals and the predicted metabolite structures. And we analyzed those through the 27 mammalian toxicity pathways that included uh, some of the ones I mentioned earlier. And we decided to use this TOXPI approach. This was an application developed at EPA in collaboration with UNC Chapel Hill 
and I took the, the data, the prediction numbers from the AdMet predictor and scaled them at 0 to a 100. Uh, if they were binary, they were 0 or 100. If they were uh, numerical, uh, they, they were scaled to 100. And essentially, uh, it allows you to sort of look at the sort of promiscuity of a toxicant. Um, now, we did decide, since there were 10 genotoxicity predictions, to collapse those into one, which was the combined average of the 10, uh, just so that the data weren't too skewed towards genotoxicity. But we certainly can look at individual pathways as well, as we, and we have. Um, this is sort of a, a histogram of uh, the, the tox pi scores across all the mammalian pathways, and so you can get an idea of, uh, you know, most of them were hitting about eight of these predictions. Um, but as sort of a normal distribution around that. We also uh, sort of took a look at the top 50 tox pi scores, and it looked like a lot of them were enriched in these uh, nitro groups, uh, nitrogen being the sort of top parent chemical where we know it actually exists. And you'll notice that nitrogen uh, was here, and all the, the metabolites were less toxic than the parent. Uh, however, we definitely had many examples where the parent was uh, uh, less toxic than metabolites, and so it just it depended on the particular molecule. But this was the, the sort of top 50 list. Again, these are sort of weighted more towards promiscuity, and it doesn't necessarily reflect potency, and so it may very well be that a lot of these chemicals uh, could only hit one pathway, but do it very potently and be more uh, of a concern to human health than one that hits a lot of pathways at very high concentrations. So, you know, we have to take that into account, and so we're just using this as an initial tool to evaluate. Uh, but when you look across all the chemicals, and we generated this histogram uh, basically by calculating the change in tox pi value from parent and predicted metabolite across all the chemicals, in general, there was a, there was a propensity towards metabolites having lower tox pi scores in the parent structure, which suggests that metabolism was a detoxification pathway, which that's good news because that's generally... Uh, what we think about is the first association with metabolism. It can definitely go in both directions. But, uh, you know, definitely I was a little surprised that it was, you know, quite so many on this side of the, the ledger. But nonetheless, we're evaluating the accuracy of these toxicity predictions, and we're in the initial stages of that. And finally, I just want to show this genotoxicity and AIMS predictions analysis. We focused uh, looking just at the genotoxicity predictions. And there, there are 10 of these, five that include uh, metabolic activation with S9 and five that do not have the metabolic activation. And uh, we, we looked at all the chemicals across these predictions. And genotoxicity predictions were summed across the, the models that had S9 and subtracted from the ones that did not. So basically with S9 minus without S9. And we ranked those. And it turned out of the top 30, 21 of these, uh, by my estimation from the literature, were confirmed to be associated with toxicity or genotoxicity or had positive AIMS tests. Uh, however, there were, uh, the, of the nine chemicals that were not, several of them, and I don't remember the exact number, but, but quite a few of them just didn't seem to be studied at all. And so, of course, our favorite um, uh, poster child metabolically activated toxicant benzophypyrene did show up in that list. Now, we don't know how many of these chemicals were in the training set. So it could be that all of them are. Uh, it could be that, uh, uh, you know, a variety of things. But what, what we do feel is that this could be a useful tool for us to help prioritize which chemicals might be good to, to follow up with a names test if that information is not available. So that, that's quite useful for us, and we're looking forward to continuing our evaluation of the toxicity pathways. So in summary, um, substrate predictions with AdMet Predictor were effective, but probably are going to be more useful to us from a mechanistic standpoint rather than prioritizing chemicals for testing in these metabolically competent systems. Um, intrinsic clearance predictions were modestly correlative, uh, but obviously they weren't intended for that application. Um, and we'd certainly like to have models that were built off of human liver microsome or primary hepatocyte data. Using the intrinsic clearance prediction cutoff of 100 microliters per minute per mig in our, uh, in the, in our analysis and our combined weighted sum approach, uh, we, we generated a manageable set of 730 chemicals that we could potentially test in our metabolically competent systems, potentially cross-referencing that with other sets to choose that final list. Uh, metabolite structure predictions were generated, and uh, for what was predictable, it did a really good job, but obviously we need a broader transformation space to be covered. Um, 
and uh, the toxicity prediction models initially assessed with tox pi visualizations across all mammalian toxicity pathways. It looks like it could be useful, but we don't want to bias the data based on pan toxicants. And so looking at subsets of toxicity pathways will probably end up being more of an of a actual useful approach for us. And then finally, uh, the accuracy and the, the utility of these toxicity predictions is continuing to be evaluated as we dig deeper into these different sets as we do with the AIMS test. But it looked like that type of prediction approach might actually be useful for us. And so we'll continue to, to think about that and vet that internally. So. Without the next steps, uh, we're going to complete the evaluation of ADMET Predictor 6.5 with toxicity models, and uh, we're going to then move forward with the next version, which I believe was 7.0, or it sounded like it could be 7.1, uh, but the models have all been changed, and so the idea is to incorporate those new approaches uh, as, as fast as we can. Uh, constructing more comprehensive metabolite database will be critical for us to be able to evaluate how useful those metabolite structures that were putatively predicted uh, actually will be relevant. Complete the evaluation of toxicity models uh, with ADMET predictor and try to prioritize chemicals based on the methods that, that, and other methods that, that we've discussed and, and are, are thinking about. And finally, publish this work. Uh, no one, to our knowledge, has been able to take this large set of chemicals and analyze it this way and, and run these types of analyses. And so we're looking forward to continued collaboration with Simulations Plus in this effort and also evaluate the additional models that cover a broader range of enzymatic transformations that may be out there or developing, uh, and identify approaches for uh, predicting the extent of metabolism in particular. Um, and finally, developing in vitro and in vivo extrapolation approaches where we can use some of these PBPK models like GastroPlus to be able to uh, essentially incorporate in vitro findings into a uh, in vivo context to try to get a better handle on uh, what's going to happen in vivo. So I'd just like to acknowledge a lot of folks have helped with the, the general uh, idea of xenobiotic metabolism, but for this particular analysis of in silico uh, of this particular tool, uh, Nipa Chosky uh, was, re was really nice in helping build the metabolism database, and Nicole Kleinstrier was really nice in helping to do some of the initial work with ADMET Predictor. I appreciated that. Michael Lawless at Simulations Plus has been very helpful in helping me learn how to use the tools and be able to learn some of the tricks and, and, and capabilities. And Ray Tice, my advisor, who encouraged me to start this project. And again, thanks Simulations Plus for their uh, collaboration, and we hope to continue that relationship. And with that, I would uh, be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, it was a very good presentation. Uh, Robert, did you do you want to answer or handle the questions from the audience? All right, I'll I'll just go ahead and ask a couple of questions. So there were quite a few questions uh, before Stephen got uh, started. So um, one of the first ones is there a, a way to download the the PowerPoint slides? So uh, we'll have a recording on the Simulations uh, Plus website. So if you just go there, you can you can actually see the video uh, of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, another question was how many compounds are in the SIP inhibition model? and uh, uh, they, they vary somewhat. Uh, they all are from uh, the literature, so we, uh, um, uh, but like for 1A2, um, there's uh, a little less, uh, over 100 molecules, and then for things like 2D6 and uh, 3A4, there's over uh, 600 molecules, uh, 2C19 is closer to 1,000. Uh, so most of the data sets look like there are uh, uh, over 600 molecules uh, in each one of the individual isoforms, and then 1A2 uh, is a little bit smaller with uh, about 130 or so uh, uh, molecules. Um, so one question for you, Stephen, that was asked is, is what is a high-content assay? Very good. Yeah, so a lot of folks that do uh, in vitro cell culture models uh, will will add dyes and various uh, types of sort of indicators of different cellular components. So high content assays is, is simply referring to uh, basically using dyes and antibodies and other approaches to try to to basically diagnose what perturbations a chemical is causing within a living or a 
previously living cell and using that information to capture sort of a broad spectrum of multiple processes that have come together to either modulate a stress pathway, a, a particular protein that's associated with a given molecular signaling event, or uh, or other things that, that, that basically will stain. For one example might be transporter activity where a lot of these in vitro liver models will, will polarize and form biocanaliculi and you can actually use dyes to, to assess how much of a fluorescent chemical might accumulate into a biliary space. And so basically just imaging techniques to generate, to translate number, uh, image, image data with different probes into uh, actual numbers that you can then use for uh, dose response and, and analysis. Okay. Uh, so another question was about your analysis of the five P450 predictions, and uh, it says that you used a linear relationship and even chose coefficients based on the relative expressions. Uh, and the question is, did you fit the? Did you try fitting the coefficients instead to see how um, different they were from the native expressions? Um, if I completely understood the question, well, the answer to the question is no, we did not do that. Um, you know, in the, in the absence of understanding how useful the models could be, uh, you know, we didn't do an extensive amount of evaluation of how we would go about combining these. And obviously, with just the five enzymes, we're not reflecting all the enzymes that could be working in the liver. And so, um, you know, I would say you know, more work needs to be done there, but we did, we did not do any kind of additional analysis. The, the general idea was if I know CYP3 or 4 is making up, you know, 40% of the liver, and if you look at drug clearance anyway, it probably makes up you know, more than half of all drugs go through CYP3 or 4. Um, making sure that the clearance prediction across multiple enzymes is weighted towards that particular enzyme uh, was definitely something that intuitively made sense to me, but, you know, definitely we have not evaluated you know, other ways to, to combine these data at this time, although we're thinking about it. On, on that point, there's a, this, this is Bob Clark, there's a, there's a small clarification. For, at least in, in Admet Predictor 7.1, the clearances are already weighted by expression level in, in microsomes. So there's and, no need to do the weighting that, that um, Stephen's talking about. In, in 6.5, yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, an, another question is, uh, basically, if you, if you have a metabolite and it's toxic, how can you control that metabolism? Um, how can you control the metabolism? I don't think you can control the metabolism. You can modulate yeah. it maybe by using inhibitors, but uh, I, I don't mm -hmm. completely understand the question. Um, I, yeah, I, I think maybe... He's coming from a pharmaceutical uh, approach, so if, if so maybe if that, how yeah. can you attenuate that metabolism? Yeah, yeah. So there, you know, definitely you could think of ways to to put multiple uh, sort of uh, modulators in the same cocktail, where you use an inducer that might induce enzymes that are favoring uh, detoxification pathways and. Mm and sort of reducing the formation of a toxic metabolite. So, for example, acetaminophen is uh, metabolized 95% into phase two conjugates that are largely thought to be uh, not associated with the toxicity that's seen with acetaminophen, but that 5% that goes down the normal, uh, down the, the quinone route and it leads to reactive oxygen species. If you have a person who takes alcohol at the same time, they can actually induce their CYP2E1 expression and, and favor a much more of that metabolite to be formed, which could be, you know, uh, potentiate toxicity. And so you could think of ways to, to modulate the expression of the detoxification and, and toxification enzymes if you understand that pathway. Um, you, know, you know, obviously at some point you're worried a little bit about extra hepatic metabolism where you might have compensatory mechanisms in the liver to detoxify and to handle free radicals that might not be present as, you know, in other tissues. And so, uh, but you, you could think of lots of ways to go about that. We, we certainly in, at the NTP are more interested in trying to identify uh, chemicals that have this potential rather than trying to engineer around it, although, you know, from a green chemistry standpoint, you could certainly envision developing those tools as we understand better uh, these mechanisms. Yeah, and, and just to adding, with, with if you're optimizing a compound, um, in, you can use our tools in MedChem 
uh, studio MedChem designer and AdMed predictor uh, to you know determine how that toxicant is being produced uh, via one of the SIPs, let's say, and then you you can try different experiments modifying the chemical in order to block that side of metabolism. So yeah, that could certainly yeah. work. But you know, in that's our an case, optimization. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. From medicinal chemist and pharma, yeah, that could definitely. That's the traditional way to do it. I would imagine. Okay, so another question is, is, is what other in silico models uh, relating to metabolism have you, uh, are, are you evaluating, and how do they compare? Or have you done any um, I don't, I'm not sure I'm ready to talk about that at this point. I think we're interested in all metabolism prediction models that are out there, but at this point, it's a bandwidth of, uh, you know, a smaller set of folks working in this area, and so um, I think we'll have to to judiciously choose, uh, you know, what to look at, but we're definitely aware of different uh, software platforms that are out there that might even cover a broader range of transformations, and so we're thinking about those. But it really wasn't germane to this particular webinar, so I didn't mm -hmm. need to really go into it. That sounds fine. Okay, and then and then another question was about the the training and test set. So, you know, I can certainly take all the molecules you've identified and and determine whether they were in our our, our training or test sets. And that would be great. Um, we you know, that, definitely appreciate that information. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate everybody hanging on. And and Stephen, if, if if we've got a few more questions, uh, if you could answer. Um, sure. So one of them is any priority in choice of endpoints to study in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. Um, <laughs> That's a great question. I think you know we're definitely interested in uh, a lot of things, and part of the Tox Twenty One effort is to really identify what pathways are going to be most important for, for us to have you know, more definitive in vitro models that can extrapolate into an in vivo context. So I, I would say, you know, certainly, you know, if I had to sort of take a stab at, you know, a few things, you know, endocrine disruption is certainly something that, you know, the TOX21 partners have been interested in. Mm -hmm. And so I think understanding modulations and those pathways associated with endocrine disruption, and so it would be estrogen receptor binding, androgen receptor binding, um, those types of things, and, and taking largely a pharmaceutical type approach, I would imagine, at least one, one way of thinking about it, uh, to try to do that uh, kind of analysis and taking some of the assay systems that maybe are more evolved and, and looking at the utility of those alternatives. I think uh, another area that we, we, we're interested in here at NTP is genotoxicity. And so, you know, sort of having an umbrella assay that can, uh, you know, allow us to say something has the potential for genotoxicity uh, and then incorporating uh, a sufficient number of uh, sort of endpoints to feel confident that we're we're doing that. I think another thing that we're interested in is just philosophically understanding perturbations. And so, if a chemical is causing some perturbation, it, it definitely could be a safe perturbation that you know is commonly occurred with diet, you know, long before chemicals were produced. Uh, or it could be something that that really is causing a, you know a, a deleterious response, and we can't distinguish those yet. But by using these sort of data-rich approaches, uh, like high-content imaging and gene expression profiles, we should be able to begin to identify the pathways that are associated with those responses, and to be able to uh, develop points of departure that allow us to collectively say. This is where we're starting to tweak pathways. This is where the chemical seems to be no different than uh, control, and, and using those kinds of approaches going forward. But you know, that's just my opinion. I think that there are a lot of ways to go forward. But those would be some highlights that, that I would I would take a stab at. Okay, very good. Uh, does the NTP have any plans to run in vitro HLM or recombinant SIP assays to determine clearance data for the entire set? of uh, TOX21 compounds from the same set of experimental conditions? That would be wonderful if we could afford <laughs> to do that. Uh, however, okay. we are all public servants here, and unfortunately there, there aren't sufficient resources here uh, to be able to, to take on that type of Herculean effort. However, uh, I do believe we will look at subsets of chemicals, and definitely part of our plans within the lab is going to be to uh, employ some of these uh, metabolic clearance, metabolite profile type uh, approaches to, to generate data. We're already using some of these now in some of the efforts uh, you know, to try to understand human relevance and, and clearance. And so, yes, we definitely will be doing that kind of stuff, but not for the full set, at least not unless uh, someone knows something I don't. So. Okay. Um, let's see. One, one question was, do, do you get all your detail about metabolites from the literature, or were you using any of your own experiments? 
Um, we, we, we removed our, or we pulled our data from either literature or uh, databases that had been compiled of uh, metabolites. And so we're hoping to build on that, but definitely was not anywhere near a comprehensive database. And, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that was sort of disconcerting was that a lot of these databases were built to focus on a toxic metabolite, but not necessarily, you know, and it might be made at 0.1% of the total metabolite pool. Uh, and not necessarily the full comprehensive sets. I think, you know, building sets that are more focused on making sure we have a, you know, a complete, a more complete look at the full metabolic profile will be key. Uh, but, but we, we definitely pulled it from literature and databases, and that was it. Okay, and then there's a question that, that I'll try and address. It's uh, about the uh, applicability domain of the prediction space. Uh, for the chemicals and, the, and then the training set. So uh, with, within AdMet Predictor, uh, when, you build a, when we build a model, uh, we have a, a particular training set and then we have descriptors that are used to uh, make that prediction. And for uh, each one of the descriptors, we know the maximum and minimum value uh, in the training set and then we add 10% uh, borders around those uh, minimum and maximums and then when you take an arbitrary compound and um, uh, use the model to predict its value, uh, if, if that model molecule uh, is outside the 10% uh, of the minimum or maximum, uh, then we would flag that as outside the uh, applicability domain of the uh, uh, model. And um, this is available for, for most of the models. Some of the atomic site models uh, we're not able to, we don't uh, measure the applicability or don't report the applicability domain. But Steve, could you go back to, I think one of your slides you were showing uh, kind of what the applicability domains uh, for, for some of the predictions. Um. I think that was different. Well, I guess it was the, the, the toxicity uh, predictions. Didn't you say some, somewhere out of the uh, applicability domain for those? Um, oh, yeah, so it would be uh, probably the substrate calls. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, right here. Uh, I, I mentioned it here, I think, was the first time. So I, I do want to comment on this, and I didn't want to do it during the normal the webinar, but... Um, so some of this was my fault. So when I initially did the analysis of the full 10K library, I didn't go through and look at every individual chemical. And so, but eventually I, I began to look at some of these 500 chemicals because they weren't being predicted in any of the models. And it, for a, a large majority of them, it was simply that the cast number and the, the SD file that contained the structure, it had two components. So for example, mm. let's say you had, uh, you know, a chemical, let, let's say acetaminophen, but let's say it was acetaminophen tartrate, which mm -hmm. is not a real molecule. But so the, if the tartrate structure was in there and it was sufficiently large, the software didn't know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it would just do no, do no predictions. But if you go through and you deleted the tartrate and treated it separately, uh, you know, which would likely happen when a lot of these salts would be, you know, dissolved in solution, then it would do the analysis and provide you predictions. So a okay. lot of those chemicals, when I did this initial substrate analysis, would have given you uh, applicability domain, it would have given you predictions. Um, so that number would probably be more like 150, I would guess, that were just outside the, the full, the, the, the space, and most of them turned out to just be, you know, the SD files that we had were just containing more, multiple moieties. Now it would get rid. It would it would pre generate predictions if you had a, a hydrochloride or you know some other small salt or you know sodium or something like that. But when it was a larger structure, it just did not know how to deal with that, and so it just didn't do anything. Okay. Yeah, I, I know. I in the past few days I've been working more with the, the Tox Twenty One, and there, it. it by default, in MedChem Studio, it will eliminate the smallest piece if there's a, uh, a mixture or salt. Um, and you always, I always wonder, is it, is it eliminating the, the right part? And in some cases, you have no idea. Uh, some of the salts are like a, a certain molecule and then something like PF6. Uh, um, and normally the software would get rid of maybe the, the PF6, but you know, is that compute is that's obviously what you're testing uh, in, in the assay, uh, and is is that responsible for the um, toxicity or the response in the assay? So, I think a little bit of that 
still needs to be um, uh, sorted out. And it, it just takes a long time to, uh, you know, kind of collate what's in each mixture and, and is each one of those mixtures toxic um, irrespective of, of what the counterpoint is. So. Yeah, it is, it is challenging, though, because you could imagine counter ions that are actually associated with the toxicity as opposed to the actual parent chemical structure. And so right. you know, it's definitely something we have to take into account um, at some point. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, I've gotten several comments here that uh, it was a very good seminar, and uh, I appreciate it. So uh, with that, uh, we'll end it, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Take care.